Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Daniel Tomlinson and I'm part of the Skoll Foundation team and I serve as special advisor. Uh, I'm excited to welcome you to the Skoll World Forum session, Impact Investing Cannot Optimize for Impact, a debate. We are honored to have an impressive group of speakers here to learn from and engage with. I wanna share a few quick items though before we begin. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be released publicly after the event. Language translation is available for the session and you can access the translation options in the translation tab to the right of the video window. Please feel free to use the chat to engage with each other, with each other and pose questions to our speakers. Uh, the moderator will turn to audience questions towards the end of the session. On social media, we are using the hashtag uh, SkullWF and would love for you to do the same. And after the session, you can join small group roundtable discussions on related topics by clicking the discuss and meetup button on the left side of the video screen. Uh, with that, I'm happy to turn it over to Yasmina Zaidman, who is Chief of Development and Partnerships at Acumen for opening remarks. Thank you so much, Daniel, um, and uh, welcome everyone to our debate. I'm Yasmina Zaidman, um, as Daniel said, Chief Development and Partnerships Officer at Acumen, and I am so excited to welcome you all to this session. For Acumen, part of our mission is to share insights and accelerate new ideas that engage all stakeholders that are working to solve poverty and injustice. So in that vein, the Acumen debates, which we launched in 2015 in collaboration with EY, brings together experts from across the impact sector to deliberate and ignite discussion on issues that are pertinent to the global social impact community. And they're really about helping us all challenge each other, uh, show our willingness to open our minds um, and to, to really listen and learn from each other. Since we launched the debates, Acumen and EY have hosted six of these um, on various themes related to financial and social trade-offs, the role of government and inclusive business, in fact, last year we hosted our first debate at the Skoll World Forum and we were so blown away by the response and the engagement from school participants. So we were thrilled to have an opportunity to bring it back again this year um, and, uh, and do this alongside our partner EY. The conversation today centers around impact investing, a space that many of us are involved with and is obviously very close to Acumen's work. We've spent the last 21 years at Acumen investing in solutions to problems of poverty, and I'm excited to share that in a few weeks, we'll be launching a report called Patient Capital that looks back at 20 years of investing experience and what we learned from it. It's a chance for us to really dig into both the highs and the lows, uh, the painful lessons, but also the exciting results that we saw, and to pull back the curtain on what we saw um, worked and didn't work in impact investing. So as the description of the session shared, we are seeing the impact investing space grow. Um, we're also seeing it evolve. We're seeing new players come in. And we believe that this is a critical time to explore exactly what impact investing is meant to achieve. It is a topic that is more important today than ever. And so in that context, I'm excited to hear the perspectives of all of our debaters and to hand over to our partner uh, from EY and a dear friend, Jesse Coates, who will get us all started. Thank you, Yasmina, and it's great to be here with you all again at the Skull World Forum this year. As, as Yasmina shared, my name's Jesse, Jesse Coates. I'm the Global Impact Entrepreneurship Leader at EY, and I'm joining you from a slightly cold and rainy London this evening. Um, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with EY, we're a global professional services firm uh, with a purpose to build a better working world and a social impact ambition to positively impact 1 billion lives by 2030. Um, one of the ways in which we're driving towards that ambition is by extending our services on a not-for-profit basis to impact entrepreneurs around the world to help them scale their impactful business models and technologies and by collaborating with impact investors and foundations. And it's, it's a pleasure to be continuing our long tradition of jointly hosting debates alongside Acumen. And it's my privilege as well to be moderating this important debate today with such a, a knowledgeable, experienced and passionate group of speakers. Um, you're gonna have a fantastic session. As Yasmina shared, the motion up for debate uh, at the 2022 Skoll World Forum is, impact investing cannot optimize for impact. The structure of impact investing inherently limits the problems it can solve. So how will this debate work in practice? Um, well, first, 
we'll ask you, the audience, to vote up front for whether you stand for or against that motion. We'll then have two rounds of debate. So first one speaker for and one speaker against the motion. We'll go head to head. And then another two speakers will take up the mantle and argue their respective sides. Um, We'll also open up the debate to pose questions from the audience to the speakers at the end. We won't be able to unfortunately pose every single question, of course, so please do consider your questions carefully. And finally, we'll close the debate by asking you to vote again for whether you still stand for or against the motion based on what you've heard today. And we'll see if our speakers have been able to persuade you to change your position. Um, so do you, the audience, stand for or against the motion, impact investing cannot optimize for impact. Um, please navigate to the poll function on the Hopin platform. It should be on the right hand side of your screen to cast that all important vote. And while you're casting your votes, uh, I'm honored to introduce our four practitioners of the topic. Wendy Abt, founder and president at WPA Inc, a strategic consulting and investment advisory firm focused on Africa. Amrita Bandari, Chief of Insights and Strategy at Acumen, the impact investing fund changing the way the world tackles poverty. Kanini Matuni, Managing Director at Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, a global venture philanthropy firm supporting early stage, high impact social enterprises. And Ama Latte, CEO of Impact Investing Ghana, an initiative to mobilize $1 billion in funding for impact investing in Ghana and West Africa. And so before we move into the debate itself, let me quickly just look at our polls and see if I can work out where we stand at the moment. Give me one second. Just a little delay on the poll should be coming through any second. So if the poll is just coming up, please do cast your vote for whether you stand for or against the motion, impact investing cannot optimize for impact. So I think currently we have 45% for the motion and 55% against the motion, which is fantastic. So uh, it sounds like we have some work to do to capture those all important swing votes in the next 50 minutes. Um, so let's jump into the first round of the debate where Wendy will set out her arguments for the motion for around five minutes and Amrita will set out her arguments against the motion and then we'll have a few minutes of rebuttal. So Wendy, if I could invite you to kick off the debate by sharing your perspective on why impact investing cannot optimize for impact, over to you. Is, uh, let me just get my mic. now yep you're perfect okay great so um i'm taking the position that impact investing limits the problems it can solve because it is based on some several portentous i.e dangerous errors and misunderstandings and uh, there are three in particular i'd like to talk about and then just give you sort of my bottom line so let's start with impact. Um, the presumption is that impact investors have solid evidence that what is being financed by the company or the project actually works, does solve the problem, is a solution, uh, and addresses uh, uh, poverty alleviation. But we would have to acknowledge that measuring something is not the same as testing it. So we have a massive amount of measurement going on, but we have very little testing. So that's because, of course, testing a proposition, testing a product, a service, uh, a business idea is actually difficult. 
think about clinical drug trials. So it's pretty clear that both impact investing and even ESG investing um, have signed up for uh, investing without being very clear about causality. This is a very big issue that keeps coming up over and over again. And in fact, I'd just like to note here that one of the people that we all know of is Paul Brest at Stanford, uh, who has written a lot about impact investing. And his basic assumption was that you did need to address the issue of causality and that impact investing addressed causality because, by saying that no one in their right mind would accept below market returns. So the fact that there are investors that are willing to accept below market returns is evidence that our incremental investments are important. That's a pretty tricky argument and not the classic argument that most impact investors make. Um, the second topic I'd like to mention is, in fact, about uh, sort of corporate finance 101, investing. What happens when we invest? When we invest in a company, uh, the, uh, the, in a good company, um, we drive its cost of capital down. What that means is we lower the returns of that investment, of that company, of that project. Now, that is not actually, uh, uh, the good news is that that means that there are potentially, since the hurdle rate of that company is now lower, we get more good projects. However, we are doing so because we are giving up returns. In fact, what happens in the real world is a little bit more complicated in that if the market doesn't agree that this is a good investment, let me just say, if the market does agree with us and does think it is a good investment, then returns will go down further and further as that company's cost of capital goes down. If the market, however, disagrees that it's a good capital, then in fact, its cost of capital goes up and our returns go up or it's going to be arbitraged away. So there's some basic misunderstanding about investing that seems to be embedded in impact investing and leads to conversations about double bottom line. You can have them both. There's no trade-off. A lot of confusion about this issue. The other, the final point I want to make is about scale. Many impact investors um, have a sort of venture capital uh, mind and uh, venture capital model in mind. And a venture capital model uh, means that many things don't work. You know, I don't know, one out of 20 investments will work. But it, the reason venture capital works is because it tends to be around high tech investments that have absolutely dramatic, almost vertical growth rates. Now, the things that actually impact poor people like agriculture, like infrastructure, like health, like education, are not going to have those kinds of returns. They are going to have more normal sorts of returns. So if your model is, I can put a little bit of money into something and I'm going to get great returns and great impact, I believe that that is just misguided. Because in fact, you're going to need a lot of money over a long period of time to change uh, various sectors enough for the impact to really be felt. So, uh, and once you appreciate, if you agree that, then you see why it is absolutely critical for the things that we invest in to earn market rate returns. If they cannot earn market rate returns, you are gonna be left with a tiny small investment that is not gonna produce the kind of results you're looking for. So the last point I'd just like to make sort of bottom line is, um, doesn't it give us all, or shouldn't it give us all a little bit of pause when we see so much about greenwashing and impact washing? And when we see major institutions back off of impact investing, JP Morgan, 
BlackRock. This, I think, reflects that as people have sort of experimented with impact investing, tried to solve some of the conundrums that I've mentioned about scale and market returns and actually what qualifies as real impact, people have taken a step back and I think are going to be left with more conventional sort of the hard work of finding investments and opportunities to uh, earn enough money that in fact the solution can be scaled in a meaningful way. Thank you very much. Um, I, my, you know my bottom concern is, my concern is that to date, the people that have done the best out of impact investing are the asset managers and uh, the cottage industry of people that have grown up around it, rather than the people that have actually been, in, uh, been the hardcore investors. That's a real problem. So when anyone tells you that they're in a fee-based business, you should think twice. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and some some pretty strong arguments and varied as well. And Amrita, I imagine as the chief of insights and strategy for an impact investing fund, you maybe have a different view that you're not just part of a cottage industry. Can I bring you in to maybe share your opposing view on why impact investing can optimize for impact? Absolutely, Jesse. Um, lovely to be here. And we absolutely represent that. I mean, Acumen exists because we have a fundamental belief that market forces can be used to solve some of the toughest problems of poverty. We've seen this within our work and not just within ourselves. We've seen it in the work of many of our peers. You know, when we started over 21 years ago, impact investing was a nascent sector. And now you see it being a se sector that is valued anywhere from 640 billion to the trillions, if you include ESG screens. Um, some of that money is focused on some incredible innovations that are geared to take on tough challenges as a result of impact investing. We see that in the growth of the solar enabled energy sector, solutions connecting smallholder farmers to markets, organizations enabling low income customers build financial health and access credit, and so many more. Impact investing can take on tough problems that capital markets and government alone are not able to, but I think it fundamentally I think the fundamental belief is that we have to redefine what success is, and we have to redefine how you measure it. Um, we believe at Acumen that there's no one-size-fits-all definition to impact investing. Impact investors include a broad spectrum of capital providers, ranging from those that apply impact screens to their investing, which are the most passive kind of investors on one end, to those that seek out the impact and design their expectations around them, often referred to as impact first investors. Um, the Bridgespan Group put out a report last year that lays out the case for impact first investing. Yasmina mentioned early on Acumen's releasing a patient capital report that reflects on our history and makes the case for more capital that is needed to put impact first. You know, we're seeing more family offices commit to this uh, portfolio of an impact for strategy and more fund managers design investing vehicles that prioritize impact outcomes and investors that work across that work together across the capital spectrum to achieve the impact they're seeking. So I'd love to give an example of what this looks like, what it means to put impact at the core. We sponsored, Acumen sponsored a fund called the Acumen Resilient Agriculture Fund, focused on improving the livelihoods and climate resilience of smallholder farmers in Africa, many of whom earn below the poverty line. We designed a fund with a 50% first loss layer so that we could bring in more risk averse investors. And we saw significant interest in these kinds of structures that put impact at the center. Our fund closed at 33% over our senior LP threshold. And you're already beginning to see impact that is being generated within a little bit over a year with almost 2 million people impacted. And this is only going to compound as we continue to do our work. But I will say, however, the bulk of impact investing capital is still focused on a market first returns, um, playing it safe approach, investing primarily in financial services, tech enabled solutions, ESG and developed markets. Not enough is being focused on the intractable problems of our time, but it can and it should. You know, you look at the off-grid energy sector as an example of impact investing done right. Governments were not going to solve the energy access crisis alone. Extending the national grids were expensive. It takes time. And for a number of countries, you have the kerosene mafias that reign supreme. And, um, you know, in 2010, just over a decade ago, 
1.5 billion people still lacked access to electricity. Kerosene was the primary lighting source for over half of all households in Africa. A market for alternative options did not exist. By 2014, Acumen and a few other impact investors invested in two organizations, among others, that have been at the forefront for changing the sector, D-Light and Mcopa, two companies selling solar lanterns and home systems. In Kericho, a town in Western Kenya, the number of products available grew from two to over 80. Prices were reduced by 65%, sales grew by 32X. So we're seeing scale. We're not just seeing these companies stay at a small niche, niche space. People have choice, more disposable income, they have dignity. So now we have a burgeoning sector where over 300 million people have first time access to electricity through off-grid solutions. But this required a competitive market approach, product refinement and time. It required capital that was willing to be patient and be willing to accept sub-market returns for this stage of growth. We've exited our stake in MCOPA and most of it in D-Light to make way for other market return focused investors to take them to scale as they should. But these companies are our impact unicorns. The focus is market creation, a whole new customer value unlocked and a 2X return on invested capital. So this is really my main point and why I believe that impact investing can optimize for impact. I think different kinds of capital are needed to solve a range of problems. It requires understanding the impact you're looking for and your financial risk profile. Not everyone is going to be impact first, but not everyone wants market returns. Doing well by doing good, I believe should not be the mantra of the impact investing sector. It, the sector has to be up to the task to move beyond the binaries that, have, that we've been operating within for-profit, non-profit, charity, investor, market subsidy. We need more impact investors, be it individuals, family offices, institutions, to recognize the nuance and complexity, to recognize that capital needs to be creative, it needs to be collaborative and work together for the problem. I mean, in closing, I'll just say I've been on the board of Burn Manufacturing, an improved cook stove company in Kenya for the last seven years. And we made a decision to put money in at a time in which no one was putting money in cook stoves, even though it was proven to avert deforestation and, inc and increase disposable income for low-income communities. We believe in their impact potential and the focus on long-term financial sustainability, and we took a real risk for that impact and have seen them scale. They have sold over a million cook stoves and are really at a path in which they're going to um, see their impact scale even further with a focus on financial sustainability. So for us, we fundamentally believe that impact can be used as a means, not an end. And we need to figure out a way for us to make capital work for us. Um, we need more of that mindset and we are seeing it. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. Um, and some great points around the ability of impact investing to be patient and be impact first uh, as you as you think about it through uh, through your acumen fund lens um, and some great examples as well wendy in just kind of a, a minute or so do you have any um comments um, or reposts you want to make to amrita or on any of the points that that she made well i guess the the problem here is that we're sort of arguing case studies you know, this company that was successful, that company that wasn't. We're also throwing around terms like uh, uh, cook stoves have uh, reduced deforestation, cook stoves have uh, improved health outcomes. Um, in fact, uh, it, the evidence of either of those is not, not, very, not very straightforward, not reliable enough for more capital to plow into those uh, solutions. Um, and I, I'm, remember, let me just give an example. You know, there was nothing bigger than microfinance um, as uh, uh, an investment uh, that was going to help uh, poor people, especially poor women. 50 years was spent putting a lot of money into my donor money and uh, philanthropic money into it. As it turns out, it is way more complicated than uh, a solution. It's actually not a very direct solution. We have come up since that time with other things that seem uh, uh, to have greater odds uh, and uh, stronger evidence of success. 
We have the same situation that's occurring with smallholder farmers. Smallholder farmers have been the attention of poverty uh, alleviation efforts, again, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years in Africa. I'm working on a project in Ghana now, which is at a very sort of different scale. Um, uh, but smallholder finance and the solutions that have been put forward to help small farmers make an appreciable, a significant change in their income is really hard to find. We're going to be trying to actually test some alternative solutions for smallholders around a uh, uh, around a commercial uh, farming operation uh, to reduce uh, to increase the amount of protein that's available um, uh, and to decrease the use of uh, foreign exchange reserves for food imports, which is where Africa primarily is. So I think we need to be a little bit more modest about uh, the successes that we claim and the evidence that we've got and uh, the size of uh, the problems uh, that we're talking about. So we are definitely talking that we need billions and billions uh, to invest in agriculture in Africa and in infrastructure in Africa. So. Well, yes, there are numbers that are thrown together for ESG investing. When it comes down to it, and let's just take Ghana, for example, look at how much private sector investment in agriculture, true private sector, either impact investing or, or, or market rate, it is a tiny number. It is in the millions over, over decades. So I, I just challenge us to be a little more modest about what we claim as evidence of the success of impact investing, which is not to uh, uh, discredit the, the motives, uh, particular successes that we've had, uh, but it is to say, let's be, uh, let's be careful about whether impact investing is actually going to catalyze. Uh, we've been at it as Acumen has for 20 years. The results from blended capital, which means impact investing alongside market rate, has been a disappointment to everyone as a recent uh, Center for Global Development report uh, indicated. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Amrita. Um, and, and just a quick uh, reminder for the audience to keep those questions and comments uh, coming as we will open up for audience Q&A um, towards the end of the debate. And we'll now move on uh, to our second round of speakers, uh, where I'll invite uh, Kanini to, uh, to follow Wendy and argue for the motion. And then I'll invite Amma to argue against the motion. And again, we'll have a few minutes of rebuttal before we open up. up. And I just wanted to share, um, Kanini and Amma, for your benefit Benefit that I think where we're at now, we're at 49% of the audience voted for the motion and 51% against. So we're right head to head. There's everything in it, everything to play for. So Kanini, if I could ask you to take the floor and share your thoughts on why impact investing cannot optimize for impact. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jessica. If, if you allow me, before I do that, I, I was a little bit disturbed by the earlier speakers, by both actually Amrita and Wendy. I mean, there was a constant reference to Africa, constant reference. I heard the term poor people used several times. Um, a lot of the examples that were being given were Africa focused or India focused. And I, I really do think we need to be careful here because in my mind, impact investing or investing with an impact lens is really about solving the world's problems. And when you look at climate change, that's not, an, that's not a problem just in Africa or India. It's a problem that we're all experiencing and the, that we're all living. When you look at problems such as racial inequality, I mean, I don't have to go through um, what we saw happen in the US over the last uh, two years. So I think Unfortunate gender inequality is another issue that is not Africa or emerging market specific. So I do think whichever side of the argument that we're on, Jessica, we do need to be super careful that this is capital that is being deployed for a population that may be underserved in some shape, form or manner. 
but it does not necessarily mean that they're poor or they're in Africa or they're in India. So I just wanted to start off by just, you know, reframing um, the arguments that have been put forward. This is These are issues that are facing the world as a whole and not just emerging markets. So now just going into the argument space. So, you know, I, I think my position is that there are things that we can do to improve how we optimize for impact. Okay, I'm not sitting here saying that it's a lost cause. I mean, I'd like to start off with actually somebody put this in the comments and I really liked what, what they said there. And that really reflects my mindset. One problem that we have with impact investing is that we are using the, exactly the same financial instruments to invest in social entrepreneurs who are trying to solve real world issues, climate change, gender inequalities, racial inequalities, with the same instruments that we used to invest in Twitter, in Google, in Snapchat. I mean, there's something very wrong with that, Jessica. So I think that's the first thing that as investors, we just need to sort of take a step back and start to use instruments that are going to incentivize impact in the right way, but at the same time, ensure that there is some form of financial return that goes back to investors. People have just started to use these instruments. I mean, just you know, a few examples, we have revenue link loans where an investor takes a certain percentage of revenue from an, a social enterprise capped to a certain amount based on what was invested, okay? And it's a win-win situation on both sides. You have impact link loans that incentivize impact and reduce the amount of the loan paid depending on specific impact milestones. Now, Jessica, we still need evidence around the, uh, the traction around these instruments. There are significant transaction costs to make these happen successfully, but I do think that is one clear way in which we will be able to solve this problem. And unfortunately, as impact investors, we seem to be shying away from those instruments and just picking the ones that were off the shelf that were used to, um, to generate you know, 50x returns in three years. That is problematic. Now, my second argument is about scale. I know Wendy mentioned the scale issue, but I, I want to approach it in a slightly different way. And, and this is another problem that we have as an ecosystem. If for one minute you look at the value of assets, just let's take the U.S. as an example. So I think Amrita mentioned family offices. The value of assets sitting in family offices today in the U.S. is about $5.9 trillion, okay? The value of assets sitting in foundations is about $1.2 trillion. When you look at the potential for the family office assets to be deployed into impact, it's massive. The last research report I saw showed that only one out of four family offices deploy capital with an impact lens. And when they do that, it's only 10% of their total asset allocations. So I think as long as we have all this capital sitting at the fringe, it's going to be really difficult to be able to make this change happen and really, really difficult to get to real scale within this sector. And I think there's not very big things that need to be done. We need a signaling effect. We need folks like Kenny Arth, for example, who come out and say, we are going to allocate 100% of our assets to impact first investing. And then that will help follow on new capital from, you know, from larger institutional investors. So that is a structural inadequacy that I feel needs to be worked on in order to help optimize for impact. Um, and then my last point, I think somebody mentioned it here on impact measurement. I mean, th th this is something that keeps me up at night as a practitioner. There are so many ways to measure impact, impact outcomes. I mean, people have become overnight millionaires just saying that they're consultants measuring impact. And I do think this is problematic. Wendy talked about um, the whole issue of evidence, which I agree with. But more importantly, as an ecosystem, we need to follow what's been brought forward. For example, the IFC. The IFC has brought forward the, um, the principles for impact measurement and management. That's a step forward. I think about 300 billion in assets, organizations controlling 300 billion in assets are now signed up to those principles and they're going to start to implement them and they're going to be verified independently. And I think what we're starting to see now is there's so many people who claim to be impact investors but when you look at the results, they're actually not. They're just 
masquerading as impact, but they're really not. So I do think we do need to do a lot of work around this area, around aligning our measurement, aligning our language, and really putting it out to the market more than just case studies. I think case studies could can be powerful, but we do need alignment in how we're talking about outcomes and impact. Thank you, Kanini, and thank you for recentering us on this global impact conversation, uh, for putting forward some really interesting ideas of new alternatives that can crowd in capital, um, and also your last point around impact washing or, or uh, being wary of, uh, of those masquerading um, as being impact first. And Amma, obviously your work is dedicated to mobilizing impact investing across Ghana and West Africa. So I imagine you believe impact investing can and does optimize for impact. Could I uh, invite you to take the floor and share your arguments uh, in response? Thank you, Jesse. And it's been a great pleasure listening to everyone. Um, Kanini, I felt that you were arguing actually um, for um, um, or, or against the motion, because a lot of the things that you say are things that actually show that impact investing can optimize for impact. So if you think about the definition of impact investing, it's about intentionally deploying capital to generate a positive, um, measurable social and financial uh, environmental impact alongside a financial return. And if you think about what it means to optimize, and um, I like to, to look at a, a dictionary definition. The Cambridge Dictionary says to optimize is to make something as good or effective as possible. So then the question says, can we deploy capital intentionally in ways that can make impact as good or as effective as possible. Understanding that we're in a world that is still evolving, always improving new products, new solutions every day, but can impact investing deliver the best of what's possible? Can it optimize? And um, if you talk about optimizing, then you're comparing impact investing to other tools. And the other tools would be nonprofit models or state funded models. And the question is, is impact investing a valid tool for optimizing impact? In, in the previous round, um, Amita gave a lot of examples of impact investing being used to deliver solutions that have delivered better or more effective solutions when compared to other tools. Um, many of them, like Kanini said, were, were are tech enabled solutions, they are in financial services, but we can't imagine them away. Once they exist, once they have enabled, you know, a staggering 1.159 million and people across the world to have access to financial services and a plethora of, of other services that, that come with just having access to an account, like insurance and credit and transfers and all that innovation, you can't imagine it away. And um, these things are used now in combination with other tools, nonprofit tools and state funded tools to deliver um, impacts that could never have been imagined 20 years ago. And so this proves that impact investing can optimize for impact. It may not always optimize for impact, but it can. So then the question is, how can we increase the volume and percentage of impact investing that drives outcomes like this? Um, it, 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 it can optimize, but it doesn't always. How do we make sure that it always optimizes for impact? And I think there are a number of things that are needed. Um, Kanini spoke um, about some of them and also some of the previous speakers. The first one is catalytic capital. Because when you're trying to solve a problem that has higher risk because it hasn't been solved before or because um, it, 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 and there are, it's a complex problem, then you need patience, you need to take on more risk, which may mean that the instruments that you use must have some concessionality built into it. It needs some flexibility. And um, there, there may be a transition where at the beginning of the initiative, when things are more risky, you have more patient capital, and then you transition on to um, more sort of market rates capital providers. So um, catalytic capital is an essential tool to be able to enable impact investing to be more effective because it bridges the, the capital gaps. It helps us to have a breadth of impact. It enables a more innovation, innovative products to come into the pipeline. And from where I sit in Ghana, 
where we have a 43 billion um, SDG financing gap. We need to um, have 43 billion of investments from the private sector if we are to achieve the SDGs. Um, it, is, it is impact investing is an essential part of the mix. And um, we have um, situations like 6 billion in funds sitting in pension funds, very risk averse institutions. Um, and yet over the last year, we've worked with um, local pension funds to begin to understand their risk return and requirements and to begin to imagine what a product could look like that would enable them begin to invest in maybe less risky uh, um, um, uh, uh, institutions that have been set up to deal with issues in financial services, in infrastructure, and, and, and we're beginning to make progress on those. So I see impact investing as a really important tool in a tool bag that has a lot to deliver that other tools can, um, um, can piggyback on. My second point is about impact measurement. And I totally agree with you, Kanini. We need to be able to measure impact in a more consistent manner to be able to know that we are optimizing for impact or else we're just speaking different languages. It will also be easier for investors to make decisions if, if, if they know that they can rely on the data that they are, they, are, they are looking at. So initiatives like impact weighted accounts where you try and um, assign a monetary value to the impact to make it, um, to, to present it in language that investors understand or efforts by the impact management project or by the global impact investing um, network and, and iris platform to create sort of to harmonize measurements and to create more and more um, coherence in the way that we think of impact and the way we measure impact are important and the closer the world gets to having similar language similar measures and independent verification of impact results the easier it will be for investors to be able to factor these into their decisions because um, um, companies that don't think of impact have a, a cost. There's a monetary cost to, to, to not um, taking into account the, the social and environmental impact of business decisions. Somebody pays the price. It's just not the shareholders. And the moment that is quantified and shareholders um, begin to have some of those costs reflect in their returns, um, um, it, it will begin to change immediately the, the practice and um, because it will align interests in ways that um, are in, in more in line with the reality of how the world is. And I look forward to those days and um, when we move to more harmonized impact measurements. So I'll end by saying that um, impact investing is not the only tool that can optimize for impact in a given scenario, but it's an essential tool for optimizing impact. And the real question is, how do we continue to improve it? How do we better combine impact investing in ways that increase the effectiveness of other methods? And I look, for, I look forward to, 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 to seeing some of the solutions that come out of the discussions at school and in the years to come. Thank you, Amma. Some really convincing arguments and I think very complimentary to uh, to Amrita's points up front in the first round as well. Kanini, I do want to give you the opportunity to respond to any of the points that Amma made as well, and then we will open up for audience mm -hmm. Q&A. Yeah, so I mean, I, I loved the arguments, um, but I think one thing that I'm missing from this discussion is, I mean, I do agree impact investing is one of the tools in the bag and it's, you know, on, on, on your sort of continuum of, of how you utilize capital. I actually see in, impact investing as the middle ground between market rate investing and philanthropic grants. So absolutely agree with that. But I do think Amma is being a little bit too rosy eyed in terms of um, her view on catalytic capital. And, and one of the things that I have to point out here is that GIN, uh, the Global Impact Investing Network, a few weeks ago did um, a survey on their members. So obviously GIN has members, many of them are institutional investors who, who, who claim to be impact investors. And the question in the survey was, tell us how many of you are deploying impact capital? And out of what you're deploying, how much of it is considered to be really catalytic? So catalytic capital, exactly as Amma has described it. Capital that goes to social enterprises with a little bit more risk um, and high impact. And this is the result. So out of $49 billion 
that was deployed in new impact capital by GINS members in 2019, only 7% of that was actually considered to be catalytic capital. Okay, so what's actually happening now is that the majority of impact capital that is being deployed is still looking for mainstream and outsized returns and outsized impact. So I do think there is a there there is a struct, still a structural issue that needs to be sorted out here. When we hear all these big numbers, our immediate thought process is it's catalytic. It's going to support social enterprises to do great new things and solve the world's problems. But when you dig deeper you do realize that there is still a problem in terms of how that new impact capital is being deployed. None of it or very little of it is actually catalytic in the end. Thank you, Kanini. So qu quite a shocking statistic there. Thank you um, for sharing that. And I think now we, um, we will move into audience Q&A. So just quickly to say a Big thank you to Kanini and Amma and also Wendy and Amrita for, for really nailing your arguments, I think, and a really broad range of arguments, both for and against the motion today. Um, so I'm just going to go down and take a look at the questions and obviously feel free to continue to add your, your questions as we go and we'll try and address as many as we can. Um, Amrita, I'll maybe come to you um, with the first question. Sure. For impact outcomes, how are you able to manage understanding of net outcomes? If there's harm, is it counted or disclosed? How can impact investing capital? Uh, how can impact investing capital invest in internal infrastructure to prevent harm and ensure community feedback about positive and negative impact? Something that both Wendy and Kanini actually referenced. Yeah, it's. I appreciate the question. It's a really nuanced. Um, it's a really nuanced question over here, and I'd say, you know, we are on a journey to understand uh, and have better language in how to talk about impact. So one of the ways in which we do it is go direct to the customer, um, really understand from the perspective of the beneficiary of the impact. What are they seeing? How are they valuing the impact? Um, what is the impact, what is the effect of the impact on their lives? Um, and then how do we bring, bring it back to the business models that we're supporting and the broader questions that we're looking and, and the broader hypotheses that we're looking to um, focus on and double down on. So that is really the way we're bringing in this customer voice, this community feedback. And we're taking it, you know, we're, again, as I said, it's an exploration. We're now looking even further on and looking at the kinds of business models that maybe don't focus on B2C solutions, but are more about enablers. What are the kinds of questions that we need to be probing on and exploring over there so that we're going beyond the obvious and asking the more nuanced questions to have a much deeper and richer understanding of the impact. Thank you, Amrita. Um, Amma, maybe I'll come to, to you um, next. Um, in addition to impact investing, there also needs to be more incubation and incentivization of entrepreneurs who are interested in reaching underserved markets with for-profit mechanisms. Um, but who is cultivating this pipeline for solutions and founders? Um, very few people are, and it's not just about incentivizing entrepreneurs in general. Um, we need to incentivize entrepreneurs that are close to the problems they are trying to solve. And so um, for in my context in Ghana, we need to incentivize not MBA sitting in Harvard University to fly down to Ghana to solve problems here, but the many local entrepreneurs who um, are solving, already solving many local problems, who are looking for financing to, to scale, um, who are looking to diversify their product lines to be able to deliver more, more impact. And those are the ones that we need to, to um, incentivize in this context. And as, just as we incentivize entrepreneurs in other contexts to solve problems in, 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 in those contexts. And so it's important to um, really ensure that um, incubation acceleration is happening in local contexts for entrepreneurs who understand the problems and have the local uh, knowledge and networks to be able to deliver solutions and then to be able to um, look at how those solutions connect um, in, in ways that can enable scale. Um, in most places, it is government that does a lot of SME support, incubation. SME support is a public good, and, and this is something we need to continue to encourage. 
but it's also a place for catalytic capital. And certainly at, 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 at um, Impact Invest in Ghana, we have an enterprise support collaborative in Ghana made up of local actors that are exploring how to increase funding into enterprise support incubation and acceleration that includes lobbying governments, engaging catalytic capital investors, et cetera. And we, we need more um, locally led groups like this that can drive investments into the, the, the areas where, where you can have uh, impact and, and new entrepreneurs um, in various contexts. Thank you, Amar. And uh, Kanini, if I could come to you with a question. Um, there's a question here around what institutions or stakeholder groups do you identify as those that have the power to institutionalize impact investing? Thank you, Jesse. As, as Amma was just speaking, I was nodding because I was like, yes, she, she's actually got that bit because, I mean, Amma mentioned government. And I think that's one thing I find in a lot of impact investing conversations, people tend to ignore out of the room. It would be interesting to ask school how many government folks actually attended this session or, or, or some of the other sessions. So government does play a significant role. They can actually bring in capital from the uh, margins. Quick example, the UK's big society capital, um, $1.8 billion worth of assets brought in from the unclaimed assets agency in the UK passed by government and all that capital has been used to really revitalize social impact investing in the UK. So I do think that is something we do need to bring more into conversations. We need to have government folks sitting at the table with us to help bring in and institutionalize impact investing. One quick one, all the mainstream investors sitting out there, I talked about the family offices, $5.9 trillion cannot be sitting at the margins. So we need to talk to the guardians of that wealth, wealth owners, high net worth individuals, principals, families, and just talk them through and understand what are your values and could you actually start to invest in line with your values? So I, I would say those are two principal um, stakeholders that we should be focusing more on in this conversation. Thank you, Kanini. And and Wendy, if I could uh, if I could come to you with one of these questions as well. Um, there's a question here on on your views or your reflections on the notion of the primacy of or possible primacy of financial return over social return. Um, a comment here that we're willing to concede our collective human well-being for profits for the few. We define risk as potential loss of funds rather than as climate or social disaster. And how could we flip the script to instead center social outcomes that can also deliver financial returns and how to share those returns among more actors? Is that how you think about it? Or, or do you have other um, perspectives about this financial return versus social return debate? Well, I think one thing that happens frequently in these conversations is that um, people underestimate the, their, the importance of acting as consumers and as citizens. Um, problems of climate change, gender inequality um, are uh, really need the concentrated attention of, of governments. And um, as so as citizens and as consumers, I think we can have more impact than we can as investors. Um, uh, investing, as I've uh, tried to give my perspective on, is a, a kind of an unreliable and not um, a sufficiently powerful force um, to to get the changes that we uh, that we're all um, that we're all looking for. So I I believe that we need to mobilize the private sector, but we need to mobilize the private sector on its terms which is to earn some risk adjusted market return until we have enterprises that can um, attract those um, those kinds of funds i think we are going to be um, 
we're, we're going to run short of the kinds of solutions that we're looking for. I think to the point that was made earlier, the reason that we've talked a lot about Africa and sometimes a lot about India is that those are parts of the world where facing exactly the same problems that we're facing in the United States, they're under-resourced uh, to be able to tackle them so that you stand a better chance of um, you stand a better set of outcomes um, in some parts of the world than in others. And that legitimately has been uh, the focus of all of us over the years, trying to figure out how to, in fact, bring more resources to bear in the places where uh, it is hardest to mobilize uh, the kind of capital that's required. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And I think that's a good place to close. There's so many more great questions, but in the interest of time, I think we're going to have to move on um, and turn the all important final task back to you, the audience, to cast your final vote. So as a reminder, the debate motion that our speakers have been picking apart today is impact investing cannot optimize for impact. So having listened to the arguments today, do you, the audience, still stand for the motion or do you still stand against it or have you switched so to vote please again navigate to the poll functionality on the hop in platform um, and while you're casting your vote uh, i'd just like to thank all the speakers today thank you so much for giving up your time your energy and your minds uh, for really making this debate very lively um, and very insightful and um, thank you to acumen for our ongoing collaboration and friendship and, and thank you of course to the skull foundation and the wider skull community for making this event possible and of course uh, thank you to you the audience for showing up um, engaging with this debate challenging our speakers through your questions and hopefully now most importantly um, for deciding the outcome so it might take a a few seconds for this to come through and we shall wait with bated breath and just as a reminder i think at the outset the vote ended up being 49 percent for and 51 percent against it was very tight so we'll see which way it swung And while that's coming through, just to share also that if you're interested to learn more about Acumen and how they're using impact investing to change the way the world tackles poverty, um, then you can visit www.acumen.org. And if you're an impact entrepreneur seeking capacity building support to help to scale your impact or you're an impact investor or foundation looking to collaborate around this agenda, then you can learn more about the services that EY offers to impact entrepreneurs at www.ey.com forward slash EY ripples. So I think, um, I think I'm seeing that there's a little bit slow. We may have to share poll results in a roundup email, which we will do. Um, and finally, if you do want to continue the conversation, then you're encouraged to join the roundtable conversations happening directly after this session. Um, but thank you again. And I hope you found this debate uh, interesting, challenging, thought provoking, and look forward to seeing you again at an, oh, here we go, just very quickly. Um, I think we now have 47% agree and 53% disagree, which looks like it's a swing for the for motion. Um, oh no, sorry, it's a swing for the against the motion, yeah. which means that Amrita and Ame, you are, <laughs> you are the winners of the debate, congratulations. Um, and thank you again, everybody for joining. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at another Skull session.